This week on Dialogue, energy, climate change, and security, connecting the dots. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. Sharon Burke serves as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy Plans and Programs. Prior to her current post, she was Vice President and Senior Fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Rear Admiral Neil Morissetti joined the Royal Navy in 1976. During his career, he has commanded four ships ranging from a patrol boat to an aircraft carrier. Since September of 2009, he served as the UK's Climate and Energy Security Envoy. Jeff DeBelko is director of the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. He worked previously at Foreign Policy and the Council on Foreign Relations and is an adjunct professor at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the program. Pleasure. Jeff, I'm going I'm to uh, rely on you to do a little scene setting for us. Okay. We build this as a connecting of dots. So if you could talk about this emerging discipline that looks at climate change, at energy, at environmental impact as a security issue. Right. Well, certainly we think of the 70s and the energy crisis to put that in a broader security context. But say for the last five or six years, there's been particular interest around climate change and security and energy security. And they're not quite the same topic, but it's clearly a lot of overlap. Um, and the the range of links is wide. There are There's a lot included under that. Everything from uh, concern from sourcing energy and where it's coming from and, and the contestation around that. There's, uh, to, on the other hand, in terms of climate change impacts and how that may pose fundamental economic, agricultural, and even political security conflict um, uh, kind of threat multiplier, making those challenges even, even more difficult than in many ways they already are now. Um, those changes have big implications for all sectors of society, uh, and the military and security institutions are part of that, uh, a big part of that. And so the way that those security institutions are called upon to respond to some of those direct impacts, but then also how they are adapting and changing uh, to the changing environment is a, is a rich area of inquiry, and we have, have two practitioners here in, in that space who are, are working hard on these issues. Is it, I think I characterized it as a, a new field or an emerging field. Is that a fair characterization? Well, certainly on the climate change and security linkage, yes, um, if, if we said the last four or five years. Um, and there are many reasons for that, one of which is the science has moved in a direction that tells us that these changes are happening faster than we thought. Um, there's greater, greater extremes and a wider set of concerns that it's not just going to be a gradual uh, a set of changes that we can easily adjust to. Um, there are um, uh, greater concerns about how those impacts are going to play out in really important parts of the world that when combined with larger uh, sets of, of threats, but also opportunities, um, have really raised the profile of this issue, uh, not just as an environmental issue per se, but a broader political issue that, again, important institutions like militaries and security communities are going to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. it, it seems that at, at the heart of this, in one way, is a definition of security, or in, in this case, an expanding definition, a broader understanding of what we mean by security. And, and Secretary Burke and Admiral Morissetti, if I can get you to weigh in on a collective uh, definition, what does security mean in this context? Well, um, for me, um, my mission is a little bit different, so I, I, I can answer the question a couple of different ways. Just as a defense official, you know, for many years now, the Department of Defense, as well as with the whole of government, has been looking at an emerging security environment and what constitutes a threat, what constitutes a challenge, and what kinds of missions do our armed forces need to be able to need to be prepared for, and also who do they have to cooperate with in order to secure the interests of the American people. So I, it, you're, you're right that our understanding of the global environment and what we need to do to promote security and protect American interests has changed a great deal over the years and continues to change. It's a very dynamic situation. And I think that uh, 
you could just look within the last year or so at the variety of missions that U.S. Armed Forces have been engaged in and get a snapshot of the way in which the security environment has changed. We had forces in Afghanistan that are involved in counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, and stabilization missions. We had forces in Iraq that were handing over to a host government after a stabilization effort. We've had uh, forces uh, helping with humanitarian and disaster relief off the coast of Japan. So you know, we have a big range of missions here that have been spurred on by a variety of concerns. We also just have global presence. We protect the sea lanes, lines of communication, piracy off the Horn of Africa. There's any number of challenges here that U.S. Armed Forces have to be ready for. So you know, for us, being ready for such a broad range of missions in so many places is certainly a challenge. A conventional wisdom criticism of the military has been, uh, we fight the last war. And this seems like a quantum leap challenge in that regard, in that it's not just the last war, it's a whole new environment and a whole new definition of what constitutes a threat. You have to have some humility about preparing for the future because uh, no one ever predicts the future very accurately. And on the other hand, when you're talking about a military organization, you don't have a choice. If you're going to be able to protect your country 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you have to be building the capability, and not just the capability, but the people, and training the people now who will be ready. So you do have to make your best estimate of what you think uh, the world's going to look like and what's going to be dangerous, or for humanitarian and disaster relief, which is part of what, what Jeff DeBelgo was just saying, what you, think, what you need to be ready for, what national missions you need to be ready for. So. Yes, it, you know, that it's certainly an axiom of military life that you prepare for the last war, but you do your best to prepare for the next one, too. And I think that that's, if you look at what the Secretary of Defense and the President are talking about now, they are talking about building in an extraordinary amount of flexibility mm -hmm. into the kinds of forces we build and the way that we do strategic planning using tools like scenarios and wargaming. Uh, because we recognize that this is a very dynamic and fluid environment. You know, you mentioned can't predict the future. Recently interviewed uh, Jack Matlock, former ambassador to the so then Soviet Union for the U.S., and he said, uh, I can't predict the future, but once something happens, I can tell you why it was inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Admiral Moore said it will get you involved on this definitional discussion of how does security look in this through this lens. And I'm also wondering, is there a difference uh, in Europe as opposed to the U.S.? Well, I think a secure and stable environment is one in which, uh, as nations or globally, you're able to minimize the risk to those activities which are essential for prosperity, well-being, health. Um, and... I think in both our countries recently there's been a lot of work done as, as to what are those potential risks. I mean, we, we talk about climate security, but in a sense it's, it's shorthand for the security implications of climate change. Or in other words, how could climate change pose a risk to that secure and stable environment we're looking at? And it's part of the work that in, in, in here in America in the uh, 2010 quadrennial, quadrennial defence view, a similar strategic defence and security view in the UK that year. We've looked at those new and emerging threats not least those that pose a threat to the key natural resources that we're dependent upon, uh, food, water, energy. I mean, your priorities might vary. If you're in Africa, it's probably food. Asia, it's water. Clearly, we, everybody needs water, everybody needs food, but also, I think, in, in our respective countries, energy is a key, is, is a key determinant in, in that development of prosperity. And from a military perspective, Clear, the current operations must be our highest priority. So Afghanistan, for example, or more recently Libya, uh, Iraq. But at the same time, you know, that, in a sense, that's the dipped headlight. One of the headlights has to go on the full beam. And it has to look over the horizon, see where those threats and challenges are, and see what we've got to do. Um, whether it be as a military community, whether it be a wider security community, or increasingly, I think, as we face these threats and challenges, we recognise that it's not only all of government that needs to work together, but it's public-private sector, and it's also international and national with partners, um, which is why you've got to work closely with those people um, to get a better understanding. And at the same time, if you're sharing that work, you're sharing ideas of what it means in the ways of missions and tasks. And, uh -huh. um, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that between Department of Defense and Ministry of Defense, there's quite a lot of that discussion going on. Uh -huh. Now, your post is Envoy. Is this a new position? Yeah. It's, um, it's part of, if it goes back to what Jeff was talking about, in the last sort of, four or five years, a growing recognition um, that these threats exist and that they require that whole-of-government approach. I'm perhaps unique in the sense, although I'm an active duty flag officer, 
I actually work for not only the Ministry of Defence or DOD equivalent, but I work for the state equivalent, our Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and I work for our Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, set up in 2009, in the heady days and the run-up to Copenhagen, uh, initially just to try and get countries to focus on the fact that as well as socioeconomic and environmental implications, there were potential security implications associated with climate change, and that should shape those nations' positions as they went through the discussions. Mm -hmm. But as you know, at Copenhagen, although some things were achieved, we didn't make the breakthrough everyone was looking for, and I think uh, as our thinking has grown, my role has evolved, and it's sort of threefold. It's one, to encourage nations like to do as the United States have, the United Kingdom, to factor it into their national security strategy, to encourage my fellow military colleagues um, the need that we need to think about what it means for missions and tasks, what it means in, in, in the equipment we use, not only our adaptation but our mitigation piece today and tomorrow, but also, and perhaps again reflecting the fact that I work for these three departments, to try and join up government and encourage governments to, to take a holistic view on these issues, both at home and abroad. You also are first in your post. Yes. A newly created position. Tell us about that. This is a new post that was created by Congress in the 2009 Defense Authorization Act, and I am the first person to hold it. So, uh, it's, The Department of Defense has looked at energy security as an important issue for a long time. Um, we look at it as a geostrategic issue. We, we look at it as a cost factor. We look at it uh, in our intelligence collection. It's, it's always been something we've taken into consideration. And, of course, we're also a voice in, in the whole of government about how we look at the national interest on this issue. One of the ways where we are unique as a government institution is that we are also a major consumer of energy and that energy as an input to military operations is essential and we're a major consumer of energy. That side of our equation is as old as warfare. The supplies to military forces have always been a strategic operational and tactical good that's, that's critical to your ability to operate. What's changed now is that we are looking at a range of kinds of military tasks that are distributed, that are where we are spread across a battlefield and we're having to move supplies to a lot more places. And we also have a force that's much more energy intensive than we have before. In addition to that, we're you know, in a world where the ability of uh, harmful actors to target us, it, they're gonna focus on our supply lines sometimes. So really some of the impetus for this came out of our deployed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, who I think it was actually the um, current commander of Central Command um, who has oversight of our operations in Afghanistan and Iraq back in the 2004 time frame, who said, unleash us from the tether of fuel. And it was the volume of fuel we were consuming and the criticality of it to our missions was becoming a constraint on our operations. So this office was stood up to look at the United States military as a consumer and how to improve the energy security of our, of our actual operations and of our forces and make sure that they have the energy they need to get this job done for the American people. So it's a new, it's a new way for the department to look at energy, but it is also where we consume most of our energy. About three quarters of it we use in what we would call operational settings, so for military operations. And that amount, is, last year it cost us $13.4 billion, and it was about 5 billion gallons, which means if we were a country, we use more fuel than about two-thirds of the nation on Earth. So what we do and how we manage our energy um, can be a significant effect also on how the nation consumes energy. Does this essentially put the Department of Defense in the catbird seat as it relates to uh, developing green technologies? Yes and no. Um, Yes, in the sense that we are the single largest institutional consumer of fuel in this country. However, that means we account for 1% of total national mm -hmm. consumption. So we can only do so much. The rest of our economy has to fall in as well. Um, what's different, too, is, is that we have a very particular need, and there's a long history of military need pushing the pace on innovation. Uh, you know, many things that we take for granted now, like the Internet and the GPS, were in part, you know, the, it was a military need that stimulated that innovation. But it's always a military purpose and a military need. So you can't be sure there'll be a crossover into the civilian sector. However, some of the things that we're looking at now to both change the way we use energy and the energy we use, I think there's a potential for a crossover into the civilian economy. And it really could be uh, an important gain for our whole 
our whole society. Jeff, something that is always fascinating, fascinates me about your work, and it certainly applies to our guests as well, is that if this were a political discussion, if we had members of Congress or Parliament here, talking about climate change or energy consumption becomes a much different discussion. Mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes a he said, she said, it's uh, denial, it's, it's accusations, it's, it's political. Mm -hmm. This becomes very uh, strategic, pragmatic, dealing with realities that are undeniable. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that in this kind of work? It's a, it's a tough equation. Yeah. To well, I think there are, are a couple pathways to having this conversation in constructive ways. And, and often um, putting oneself in the shoes of a security uh, perspective, a security actor, helps you do that. There is, um, there's not the luxury of hoping for a best outcome. You, to be responsible, you have to look at all possible outcomes. You have to investigate low or unknown probabilities, and it may not be likely to happen, but you need to factor that into your scenarios, your, your strategies, and be prepared for that possible outcome. So it's a risk analysis. In some ways, you know, the insurance company analogy is one that you're not certain of something happening, but you really have to take into account these, these possibilities. And so in that sense, you don't require the 100% certainty of what's going to happen that some in that political realm would like us to have in understanding climate change or how these things are going to play out. The other is one follows the data. We heard at a, a conference here in the building today from the oceanographer of the Navy, Admiral Titley, who said, follow the data. Change is happening. We can have all sorts of political debates about how to respond to that change or um, whether it's even a change that's primarily caused cause by humans. Sure. But nevertheless, it, he said, my battle space is changing, and therefore I need to prepare. And, and when we talk about procurement in, in the military, that's decades. If, if as we are um, suspecting will be the case and are seeing evidence now of big changes in the Arctic, Yet our Coast Guard has only one, one, uh, uh, um, one cutter that can go through that ice. Um, that, to me, raises a real question of whether we are planning for a future that may have oil exploration and, and, and resource extraction, uh, greater trade, greater fishing, a lot more people trying to use that passageway and our Coast Guard and our Navy being called upon in in times of crisis, but also just in, in, to, to have a presence there. We need to be thinking uh, ahead in that, in that fashion. I think part of the challenge is it depends where you live. If I talk to colleagues who live in somewhere like Bangladesh or mm. Soto or something, it's very real and very apparent already these issues are happening. And I think if perhaps if you live in Northern Europe or in parts of America where you, you know, well, if you, actually, let's take United Kingdom. You know, if you've been there, a bit of global warming wouldn't go amiss. Um, and some, <laughs> some white wines from the whiskey distilling areas would be fantastic. <laughs> but the reality is that we live in a globalised world. And what happens thousands of miles away from where we live will affect us. I mean, you've only got to look at uh, recent floods in Thailand. Two of the big Japanese car manufacturers have parts made there. Those parts couldn't get out of the factories. So the Thai economy is affected. The Japanese economy is affected. Those come. And in a a lot of those parts were going to third countries, third party countries, to assemble cars. No parts. We are a bit of a just enough, just in time society today. I think someone described that, that, that the warehouses of the world today are on the high seas. Um, and as a result, production lines had to slow in the third party countries. So that's three, four, five, six different economies affected. And one of the challenges that we've got to face is to explain to people that. But you've got to do it in a, in a fashion, in a language that they understand, that they feel comfortable with, they can feel an affinity with, and also I think probably that they have an affinity with the message. Well, and what is that language? What is the message? I think the message is, yes, there's a problem, there's a challenge, um, not least because all that trade runs through a belt on either side of the equator where we've seen conflict in the past, probably due to food, water, health, demographics, often in countries where... The, their governments don't have the capacity to look after their citizens' resilience, um, and that's why we've seen this conflict. And these are the areas where climate change is going to have its greatest effect. And I think you have to explain there is a challenge, a problem, but at the same time you want to draw out the opportunities. And if you take the work that Sharon's been doing, and, and similar work going on in the United Kingdom, on energy in the military, it's about improving our operational effectiveness. It's about reducing the risks. It's about reducing the risks of casualties, people losing their lives or being injured. It's about reducing the cost. Mm -hmm to make us a more effective fighting force. And you can read that across, whether it's in simple things like um, using less energy in your houses or in your cars. Your pocketbook wins. 
as well as other issues, or wider, and, then, and start to do it so you draw out the opportunities. Yes, you clearly do need to explain why we need to take action, but we want to avoid the bit which becomes acrimonious and you know, you're all doomed or something like that, and put it in that context. There are opportunities associated with risk, not just threats. But, uh, about international cooperation, how would you gauge where we are? I mean, these are, it's sort of not just the globalization of economies, and it's, this is a globalization of thinking in a way, because these threats know no boundaries, clearly. Uh, wh where are we as far as uh, international cooperation? Are we anywhere close to where we need to be? Uh, in, in what respect? In, in addressing some of these issues, in addressing uh, security as it relates to environmental concerns or energy consumption. I, mean, I think you spend more time in that than yeah. I do. Uh, I mean, I'd start by saying there's international cooperation between these two <laughs> countries. We know each other, actually. We've met before this. We've met before. <laughs> we've, we've talked about these issues a lot, and we've learned a lot, certainly from, from the work that Sharon's doing. And I, um, and I hope it's a two-way flow. But um, I think there is an increasing desire to have that global dialogue. Uh, in the sort of two and a half years I've been doing this job, countries which at the beginning really weren't very interested, uh -huh. didn't understand what the problem was, now saying, well, hang on, actually, we've seen this, we've seen this, we saw these events in 2010 or we saw this in 2011. Maybe there's something in this. Um, but we want to manage, as you said, we want to manage risk. Uh -huh. Uh, often it will be the security communities, and why don't just defence, but the security communities, that will start that discussion, but then others will come into it, commercial group. And, and again, we heard yesterday at the conference from a grouping of a number of the big um, commercial companies, Coca-Cola, uh, Walmart, Tesco's, uh, Carrefour, etc., looking at these issues, both from a, from a commercial perspective and a wider environmental issues, and understanding that, you know, if we wish to prosper, there's action we need to take. So it's a, it, we're not there yet, and you know, there are some parts of the world where it's still a great challenge to have this discussion, but a growing number of nations are wanting to get engaged in the process and to try and address these issues. Are the institutions in place to coordinate these efforts? Are, are the positions in place? You, you, both of you represent new positions within your governments. Yeah. I, I would say that the, in, in some ways what is interesting and innovative and positive about the experiences you're hearing from the two of them is that it is another dimension that moves away from our almost singular focus on the all countries at the table, multilateral environmental agreements, the Copenhagen, the Cancun, uh, the Durban processes, which have frankly had real challenges getting to a global bargain on reducing uh, greenhouse gases. I would say there is lots of will to talk and not the action that needs to happen. And part, for me, of the way forward then is for us not to rely singularly on that process. It's an incredibly important process. But nevertheless, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the military, whether it's um, uh, governments at different levels than the national level, mm -hmm. there's an awful lot of innovation there. There's a lot of energy there. And in some ways, uh, at times, not the political baggage that comes with uh, the national level debates or these international level debates. And so, um, you know, you have you have folks who are getting out and doing it and making a difference now, uh, rather than trying to get to these really um, a ambitious multilateral uh, agreements where we do clearly have real difficulties um, uh, uh, still persisting. Th this is clearly too big a topic to be contained by 30 minutes, but <laughs> and we are very short on time. But before we run out, there are a couple of things I, I do want to ask you about your recent trip to Afghanistan and what you witnessed in the field that's instructive about this topic. Okay. And, and also it, it, to presage that to say, um, when you asked about our engagement with other countries and whether or not the institutions are there, you know, my starting point is, is our own institutions, which are not there. So we need to get our own house in order. But, but as we have started to engage on energy and energy as a strategic good and a tactical good, um, there really there isn't a very robust community of people who look at it that way, um, not from inside the Department of Defense or the Ministries of Defense or military organizations. But I think it does give us a way to engage on energy security with a very broad range of partners where that issue can be fraught in some relationships. But this is a way that where there's only good outcomes from talking about this. And that is, you know, what, what I saw in Afghanistan is that um, for a mission like that, I think our emphasis has always been we get whatever the warfighter needs to the warfighter, where he needs it, when he needs it. 
And our forces are extraordinarily good at doing that. Um, the question increasingly has become at what cost, and not just monetarily, but in human be beings, in lives, in the amount of people it takes to move fuel around a battlefield. And we are moving a tremendous amount of fuel and water uh, around this country. But then also there's the partnership angle in that we are trying to build a security infrastructure in Afghanistan so that this country can stand on its own and not have this threat come back that, that became our problem too. Um, so what increasingly we've seen go on is that we are trying to cut the volume of consumption at our larger bases through a variety of means. So it's really about demand management and about both technological and just processes and practices for using less fuel. And then also at some of the most difficult positions to resupply, giving them better tools. So giving them tents or shelters that are more efficient, but also solar power so that they can get off the supply line to the greatest extent possible. And we've seen the Marine Corps and the Army both using things like solar rechargeable batteries, solar generation, um, and a range of other technologies. So we've been looking at the way in which different energy technologies and practices improve this mission for us. Um, and again, not just on the, the dollar figure, but in actually getting done what we need to get done and putting fewer people at risk um, so that they, they are not moving su these supplies around the battlefield. At the same time, um, as we've helped the Afghan government stand up uh, locations for its own security forces, they don't have a, a very robust infrastructure in some places either. And so we've used solar panels and um, even you know local practices such as Adobe, which is very energy efficient material, uh, to make sure that they have facilities they need where they can have the capabilities I they need. I sincerely wish we had more time. You know, I, I say that every week because I have to sometimes, but I, I mean it. We, there's so much to talk about. And thank you for the time you were able to share with us. Fascinating topic. John, thank you. Oh, thank Pleasure. you. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.